so uh, there's a link from the lecture page to the teaching materials on Huffman coding. Uh, there's quite a lot of notes there, and there's a lot of online exercises that you can have a go at. And of course, uh, there's uh, your homework for Tuesday. So let's, um, let's get the idea of Huffman coding. So Huffman, uh, David Huffman, clever chap, figured out how to arrange for codes not only to be prefix-free, to have easy deterministic decoding, but also to guarantee that we got the shortest possible codes for the messages. So that's the, the idea is that they are, they are optimal. For a given message, Huffman tells you how to make a code that will compress it best possible. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have an example of that. We were talking about balls a moment ago. And I've, I've brought some. Now, these will just go everywhere I can tell. Um, if I put that there and that here, I've got, I've got half a chance. Imagine that these are, are the, the picture uh, of, uh, of some sort of image. Granted, the image of what might be on the pavement outside bamboo in the small hours of Sunday morning, uh, but nonetheless, uh, an image of some sort, and you can see that there's not much by way of diced carrots, but there's quite a lot of tomato. And um, uh, so we're going to try and come up with a coding for these colours uh, that allows us to to compress the image. I'll make an image by just like putting them all in a row. I possibly can. Maybe I'll need two rows. Um, okay, uh, something like. Uh, they're not going to behave, they're balls. Um, right, uh, so we've got, uh, well we might have all of the colours of the rainbow. Uh, so, uh, can we remember the colours of the rainbow? Um, what, what, what system do you use for remembering the colours of the rainbow? Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing. The Scottish approach is always to deal with the fictional Mr. Biff. Uh, Biff is not anybody's name. There's no Roy G. Biv. It doesn't make any sense. Now, in England, and in places colonised by England, like the place I'm from, uh, they teach you uh, Richard of York gave battle in vain. Uh, but he was never king of Scotland, so that's just not appropriate either. So I've got an, an open competition for a good mnemonic for the colours of the rainbow. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, answers on one minute papers, please. Uh, uh, anyhow, so we start by tabulating the possibilities. I always uh, write them down the right hand side of my piece of paper. Roy G. Biff. Right? And the next thing we need to do is to find out uh, how many of each colour we've got. And I'm sure that's not in shot for the video, so we'll just have to count noisily. Right, so for the red ones, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 red. For orange, we have 1, 2, 3, 4. For yellow, we've got just the one. For green, we have one, two, three, four, because I'm very, very careful about sectarian balance. <laughs> um, uh, for blue, that's this light blue, we have one, two, three. For indigo, that's this darker one, we've just got the one. And we haven't got any violet at all. I bought these balls for throwing at the television set during general elections. It's extremely <laughs> therapeutic. Uh, um, uh, okay, goodness me, my accent's just gone Scottish, and I started Irish. I wonder where, whether, where else it'll go in this lecture. Uh, but, uh, uh, anyhow, uh, we've got our numbers. We can immediately say, let's just not bother coding violet. Okay, 
So here's how we build up a code. At the moment, we've got six different possibilities, and we know their frequencies. What we look for is the two possibilities with the lowest frequency. So that would be yellow and indigo. I'll give this eye some serifs so you can tell it's eye number one. Yellow and indigo. And we grow a bit of tree to tabulate those possibilities. And we label the branches 0 and 1. And we put the total of the two frequencies at the fork in the tree. So that's 1 plus 1 is 2. OK? <clears throat> we're not done yet, because we're still, we haven't built the whole tree. But now we go again. Uh, we've used up yellow and indigo, but we've now got this new thing, which is this 2. So we need to find the two possibilities with the smallest frequency. So what are they? They're the 2 and the 3. So we group those two together. The diagrams do sometimes get messy, and you should be uh, ready to deal with that. Um, so we label those 0 and 1. And again, we put the total frequency for those two. That's 2 plus 3 is 5 at the fork in the tree. OK, now what have we got? We've got two fours. That's our next lowest pairing. So that will give us 8 in total. And we've got to label those things 0 and 1. Now, sometimes when you do this, by the way, you have a choice. Uh, there might be multiple ways to make the lowest uh, pairing of 2. And under those circumstances, it doesn't matter which one you pick. Yeah? Why is the lowest pairing there for 4 and not 2 and 1? Uh, because... Uh, I'm stupid. No, you're not stupid. Uh, so we used up the two ones to make the two. So they're not there anymore. Yeah, that's why it's kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no bother. No, these things are... It's important that people get what the rules are. And it's very easy when learning this sort of thing to get, uh, to get sidetracked down, down a faulty path. We need to fix that when it happens. I've got horror stories to tell about teaching this so that everybody learned it wrong one year. Um, <laughs> so, I'm a three in one. Uh, three in two in one. Right. Well, we had two ones to make a two, so that one's gone. All right. Yeah. So you can't draw. yeah. And then the next step, we, we, we didn't have the ones anymore, but we had the two. So three and two is only. Right. Yeah. You're not allowed to use the same number twice. No. You could even. Uh, I wouldn't recommend crossing them out, but you're not allowed to use them twice. Once you've built a bit of tree on top of them, they're gone. Okay? So the only things in play still now are the 5, the 8, and the 9. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So that means that our next move is to pair up the 5 with the 8. And that will give us a total of 13. And we label those 0 and 1. And uh, then we, uh, uh, can you guys check my arithmetic? I, I have a mathematics degree, and that means I cannot do arithmetic. In fact, if my trade union catches me doing arithmetic, uh, they will find me. Uh, so um, uh, this is especially true when I'm adding up marks. Uh, right, so. Um, we have a, finally, a 9 and a 13, which looks like 22 to me. Uh, 0 and 1. Tell you what, though, because I'm so bad at arithmetic, I always check. We, the total that comes out at the top ought to be what we get if we add up all of these numbers. So we've got a 1 and 3 makes 4, and 4 makes 8, and 1 makes 9, and 4 makes 13, and another 9 makes 22. Thank goodness, right? So it's one of those things, if you have an easy way to double check your arithmetic, for goodness sake, take it. Because if you get the arithmetic wrong on those, under those circumstances, I will show no mercy. Um, if there was an easy thing you could have done to check, you've got no excuse for getting the arithmetic wrong. Okay, so we finally got 
to the tree. Now we have to figure out how to read off the codes. And we read off the codes the way we've been reading off codes before. For each, uh, for each leaf in the tree, you read off the code from left to right, how to start at the root and get to the leaf we're trying to code. So that tells us that the code for R is just a single zero. R, the reds are so common that they need only a one-bit code. That's the efficient way to do it. Okay? For O, we follow from the root one, zero, zero. For Y, we get there by one, one, zero, zero. So you can see Y is quite rare and it gets a long code. For G, we have one, zero, one. For B, we have one, one, one. And for I, we have one, one, zero, one. Okay, so let's just have a quick check. First of all, do the rare letters have the long code, or the rare colors have the long codes, and the common ones the short ones? So you should smell a rat if you ever see a more common thing getting a longer code. It's not a big deal if two things that are, have this, are just as common as each other end up with codes that are only one length apart. That's not a big deal. But if a common thing has a longer code than a rare thing, that's bad. The other thing we need to check is that this coding is prefix free. Does any code act as the beginning of another code? It doesn't. You can see that the zero, the code for red, occurs later in other codes, but that's not, that's not a problem, because we can tell red apart from all the others on the first bit, and then we don't have to worry about it. So that's the thing about prefix free. It means no code is the beginning of another code, not no code is somewhere in another code. So, uh, being somewhere in another code, not at the beginning, that's fine. Being at the beginning, fatal. Okay? So, mistakes people like to make when they're doing these, pro uh, these uh, problems uh, in a hurry and are a bit forgetful. Mistake number one is forgetting what prefix free means and just saying it's, it's no code occurring inside another code. That's too vague. You have to be precise. Another very popular mistake is uh, reading off the codes backwards, which is a good recipe for actually accidentally manufacturing a code that isn't prefix-free. So uh, don't do that either. It's a good check to do. Um, and uh, the um, uh, yeah, other popular mistakes include not, not noticing a possibility for a pairing that is smaller than the one you pick. Uh, but, uh, yeah, have you got the method? Right, so let's figure out how long, uh, how many bits it will take to code all of our, our, our picture with, uh, with the balls. There are two ways to do that, and because there are two ways to do it, I encourage you to do it both ways, and make sure you get the same answer. Okay? So what we do, is we figure out how many bits we're going to spend on each color. We do that by multiplying the number of times it's used by the length of the code. So on reds, we're going to spend nine bits because there are nine of them and the code is one bit long. For orange, we're going to spend how much? Twelve. There are four of them and the code's three bits long. Yellow? Four. Green? 12. Blue? 9. And indigo? 4. Okay, so let's add those things up. 9 and 12 is 21, 25, 37, 46, 50. Okay, uh, so that's one way to do it. Uh, 
The other way to do it is like this. When we're coding up the message, we'll be working our way through the tree. We'll pass through this node 22 times. And when we pass through it, we'll give a 0 or a 1. So we're going to spend 22 bits when we're here. We'll pass through this node 13 times. And each time we do, we'll spend a bit. So we'll spend another 13 bits passing through here. So every node which is labeled with a bit choice, 0 or 1, those are contributing to the length of the message. And all we have to do is add up these numbers. So not the original frequencies, but all of the internal numbers. Add them up. Let's see what we get. 2 and 8 is 10, and 5 is 15. Uh, 22 and 13 is 35. 15 and 35 is also 50. Same answer both times. Hopefully that means we didn't screw up. Okay, so everyone got how to build the tree. Right, everyone got first of all that you first of all you count the number of times each thing is used, then you build the tree, then you read off the codes, and then you've got two ways to figure out the total length of the message. Meanwhile, if we were to give this uh, this system a fixed length code, how many bits would it take? Right, we've got six different possibilities. How many bits does it take to, rep to represent a choice from six things? Three. So we would have to give, because two bits would give us four. That's my get, get ready to go alarm. Uh, two bits would give us four possibilities. We need six. Three bits will give us eight possibilities. That's enough. So it'll be three bits each. We've got 22 things to encode. So that would be three 22s, which is 66. And we've managed to code it with 50. So the variable length code is always going to do better uh, than the fixed length code. Unless, of course, everything's really evenly balanced. But even if everything's really evenly balanced, the Hoffman method will actually produce a, fix, uh, a fixed length code. That, that, that will just turn out to be the best. The Hoffman coding approach always gives you uh, a best possible code. There might be more than one code that's as good as the Hoffman code, uh, as the Hoffman code, partly because you've got a choice sometimes in how to build a tree. You've got two ways to make a pairing with the same lowest number. That can happen. But it doesn't matter which you choose, you'll still get the same lowest number. And crucially, you'll still get the same sequence of totals coming up. 2, 5, 8, 13, 22. Which is why these questions are really easy to mark. Uh, which is why I set them. Um, uh, anyhow, that's what I wanted to cover today. I wanted to teach you to do this technique. If you want to know why this technique is always optimal, I commend your curiosity. That's not on the syllabus. You don't have to be able to explain that. But uh, Stuart and I made a video and put it on the web page in case anybody's interested. Okay, what else do I need to tell you? Uh, you have a uh, homework to do by 10 a.m. on Tuesday. And you can find that homework online. You have a tutorial next Tuesday, tutorial one on Hoffman coding. And if you go to the CS106 website, which a handful of you haven't found yet, um, you should understand that as I wrote the server, I have all the logs. Uh, the, um, uh, you will find a page for Tuesday's tutorial, and you will find that on that page there are links to two questions for you to do online. Now you'll also need to draw out a tree. Uh, so you've got two options for how to submit your drawing of a tree. You can uh, email a photo from your phone, if your phone does that, or you can download a piece of paper with a three word code and submit it that way, just by handing in the right piece of paper. But either way, that, that part of your, the drawing part of your answer will end up on that web page. Uh, that's why we did all of that practice last time, get used to that mechanism. Okay? Now, there is a quarter of a mark available for having a go at each of those two questions. So quarter of a mark each, so generous. To get that quarter of a mark, 
you must have a go at the question by 10 a.m. on Tuesday. You don't have to get it right, you just have to have a go. You must turn up to your tutorial. The tutorial allocation has happened. The CS106 webpage will tell you which group you're in, who's teaching it, where it is, when it is. So surf in, find out. Okay, and that's your, and the third thing that you have to do is after the tutorial, you will need to mark your attempt uh, at, uh, uh, at your homework problem so that you see what you would have scored. So that's always the way with tutorial problems. No marks for getting it right, but marks for having a go and being honest with yourself about how you would have done. And it's worth bothering to do this tutorial homework because you will have a test on Huffman Coding on Thursday next week. But don't worry if you screw it up next Thursday because you'll have another go two Thursdays later. So the idea is get, get ahead of the game, learn this topic, ace the test <coughs> next Thursday, and then you don't have to bother doing the one two weeks later. That's the game, remember, in every topic, it's your high score that matters. So you always get another chance, all the way to the last day of term. What else do I need to say? Just to remind you that there's no school on Monday! <laughs> <laughs> right, have a great weekend. One minute papers in the box, please.